um, it really is an art form. And we, when we look at ancient lifestyles or indigenous lifestyles that are adhered to around the world by you know many groups still, um, we see a closeness to the earth that protects these people from the kind of dangers that all of us living in North America communicating on these cell phones with these computers are putting ourselves into, you know, we're, we're endangering ourselves with. So, you know, for myself, I am certainly participating in the problem, but only in so much as I'm able to bring a solution. Um, and I see a lot of people out there rehashing information and beating their heads against the wall. And here I am with, you know, lots of new information to provide for people that no one's heard from any other source, and yet none of it is coming directly from me. I'm acting as a, a channel that's synthesizing information from many sources, including scientific ones, and allowing people to consider this information. So to me, um, it really has to do, the consciousness changes have to do with us understanding ourselves as spirit, as reincarnated beings that are tied to ancient decisions that affect us today very greatly, and seeing um, the necessity for ourselves to return to the solutions that provided for our healthy lifestyle thousands of years ago. I think the studies into agriculture and the the grain, the use of grains, the rise of agriculture, the rise of, of the use of money, currency, all of these things, you know, as we've been speaking about, also the value of gold, all of these things have undermined the real advanced knowledge of Ayurveda that pervades so many ancient cultures to this day. And as you look further back in ancient history and uncover artifacts from different continents of the world from the Neolithic period, as I describe and display in my books, um, they show quite a resonant worldview and... Um, this is one which I've taken to heart and I'm trying to show people and lead by example on how we can return to this way because really it's the only viable way, uh, the only viable way I see through these changes. So um, it's going to be fascinating to see how long this takes to ground and it's, it's happening a lot more quickly than I thought. All right. Well, I appreciate that answer. Um, Dr. Judy Wood postulates that the Twin Towers collapsed or, in her term, dustified due to a directed energy beam. Given your discussion on energy wave effects on metal in particular, can you comment on the plausibility of her thesis? I think it's plausible and possible, but um, my initial response to that is, you know, when I look at the scene um, and and that event of 9-11, I certainly um, am interested in see in, in it because of the legal uh, situation surrounding it, and because it is a, a mass murder. And looking at it in terms of um, you know in terms of criminal law, to me, if there's obvious evidence, like we have a bunch of guys carting out um, you know the melted beams of these skyscrapers that are piled up below. We have them carting them off to China and hiding the evidence. And then we have nanothermite evidence all over the place. To me, that's ample evidence to point to. And we need to keep this, you know, in terms of, um, you know, the criminal situation, we need to get these people behind bars if that's, you know, that's the only reason to bring any attention to those events. And in my mind, the only way to do that is by taking the most, you know, the present evidence we have and putting that to use to be able to explain how these events occurred. So in my mind, you know, speaking about uh, information or possible technologies that could have been involved, while there's some validity there that could have been possible, to me it's an insult to those who need uh, to find an answer directly to this and to, you know, wild speculation, which I'm not saying that's what she's doing. I'm not an authority on, you know, what she's published in, in her interviews. But certainly the uh, the idea of, directed weapons is a little bit of a distraction from bringing justice to, you know, such a, such a tragic event. Thank you, Alex. You bet. We are speaking with Alex Putney. Alex Putney's website is humanresonance.org. That's www.humanresonance.org. Okay, we're moving to the next section, which is life, form, response, interaction. And the next question is from Green Meadow. Hi, Alex. This is Green Meadow. Um, I have a question about the sun. 
We are hearing a lot of fear language from NASA and other sources about the dangerous energies from the sun. And people are talking about going into caves to protect themselves, trying to figure out how to grow plants without being burned by the sun. Do you think people need to protect themselves from the sun's rays? This is something I've heard a lot of. And certainly the frequencies of the sun have been unhealthy for us for not only decades, but centuries. And I would say thousands of years has passed since a golden era when the conditions, the atmospheric conditions were appropriate for the high life, the long lifespans, the high longevity experience during those epochs. So thinking about high resonance and low resonance periods, I think that the worst is over. I mean, certainly the events of a magnetic field flip, if that's what's actually um, ongoing right now, those events could open us up to... Um, you know, x-rays and extreme energies from the sun that we're not normally, um, you know, bombarded by. But part of the, you know, beautiful information that I have to share with people um, that's supported directly by all the ancient knowledge traditions is that the, the prophecies of the red sky or the red dawn in 2012 were related to the uh, connection with the Mayan calendar end date. All of these prophecies are, are describing red skies because they are auroral canopies or complete auroral displays that are not just, you know, swirling in the northern and some southern latitudes, but in fact enclosing and enveloping the whole planet. So in fact, I believe we're, we're shifting back to a high resonance phase, at which point those of us who are able to receive the enhanced energies that are coming through because of uh, more infrared light from the plasma, more red light from the um, plasma overhead, and, of course, less of the more harmful frequencies of light, for example, probably more UVA and less UVB and C. Um, these changes are going to, I believe, expand lifespans, and that's not conjecture. That's based on um, experimental technology, um, which in the laboratory has been able to increase growth rates and extend lifespans, and we're talking by several times. These are not just uh, insignificant amounts of, of life extension and plant growth enhancement. So I described several of these results in a web page on my site called, um, it's about the God Light, which is a fairly maniacal name, but um, it's a machine that inventor Troy Herbebees in North Bay, Ontario, um, built from an, an amazing process of dream recording, basically, and it's a plasma beam healing device that I was able to work with, and we got some very fascinating findings that it involves water is the key active ingredient um, agent, and of course it's water plasma, so we're talking about an HHO plasma. So um, these findings and his results using that plasma beam healing device show us that growth rates are possible um, enhanced growth rates are possible and enhanced life, life, um, lifespans as well. So the things that are claimed by the Hopi that speak of the DNA in everyone's body, um, accepting acoustic influences to change spontaneously, those things are borne out by the conditions created in laboratories. So I myself am planning to change my lifestyle specifically to be able to receive those energies in a healing way rather than being cut off from nature, um, hiding in a cave or a Faraday cage or any of these things. I think that the plants and trees around us are important for us for life, and that's what I'm going to rely on to be eating fruit and to be making through these changes barefoot, drinking the wonderful waters here in Lamana, Ecuador. Wow. Well, I like your version much better. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I actually, I was also thinking about um, your mentioning of the DNA of plants and animals and humans will be affected. And, you know, instantly there's kind of a little bit of fear because when humans with, mess with DNA, we kind of make monsters. On the other hand, when I listen to Robert Felix talk about previous magnetic reversals, there's a fossil record of mass death followed by new species. There doesn't seem to be much record of failed adaptions or evolution, just new successful species and some remaining from the prior extinction event. So what do you think will be the results from our DNA being affected? Well, that's <clears throat> excuse me, that's an interesting 
very interesting uh, question, and I've looked at it for several years from the perspective of Russian research, which tells us that the acoustic and luminous influences on um, developing embryos, for example, can affect their and quant in fact quantum shift their um, their genetic code into not just into a mutation but into a whole different genome. Uh, for example, frog to salamander. And that's talked about by many, many, many people. That research is quite famous now. Um, certainly this acoustic technique of developing genetic changes is what the pyramids were all about in my mind. And, of course, we see the pharaohs with elongated skulls, and we have a long history in the record of the skulls of the pyramid dwellers and temple dwellers in the ancient Andean cultures here in Ecuador and Peru and Chile. Um, all of these traditions, obviously, were preserving these DNA, the DNA of these beings in mummies. So not only were the cultures uh, identifying themselves with different genetic codes because of their cranial elongation, but they were also preserving that those bodies as evidence of their high culture. And we see that around the world. And, of course, we see a mimicking tradition of that around the world done by cradle boarding, which is not an acoustic um, genetic influence. So the Russian research on acoustic genetics has really demonstrated that the pyramids themselves are like kind of acoustic birthing chambers that I describe in my books as acting to synchronize into a heartbeat resonance the mother and the child or the newborn um, after the umbilical cord is cut and the heartbeat of the mother is not directly um, located un at the root chakra of the fetus as it's inverted in the womb. So that, that fetus in, during development has the, the heartbeat of its mother pulsing right up the root chakra. And in fact, the pyramids of the world are designed to continue that synchronization between the mother and child. And so, you know, this, um, <clears throat> the genetic influences have been spoken very clearly about by um, visiting extraterrestrials who in my book, Lightwater, I quote, as giving us the same information that there is um, a way of removing criminality from a society by controlling the acoustic influences on all of the fetuses being gestated by the um, members of that society. So that is, uh, for some people, it seems despotic, you know, uh, controlling someone's acoustic environment. It's pretty extreme controls to exercise on someone, and certainly the U.S. government is doing that um, globally with televisions and radios and all of these technologies. But I believe the ancient pyramids acted in, uh, in one of their capacities, one of their many capacities, to synchronize the heartbeat patterns of people at temples worldwide. And that this effect not only creates genetic enhancements, but also creates the um, brain brain growth enhancements that are apparent in the skull formations that are obviously not deformations but are functional brain masses. Um, so, the, you know, there's so much evidence to be collected there, and I would like to be, you know, among that wave of researcher that's able to collect genetic evidence of these acoustic changes to further support my research. And I'm not just talking about ancient genetic evidence from bodies and mummies. I'm talking about modern genetic evidence where we can... Um, use pyramid complexes to um, adapt and processes using sacred waters to influence genetics positively and demonstrate, for example, in my own DNA, um, changes that occur, you know, from month to month that can be tracked because, you know, the process of DNA testing is becoming very cheap uh, very rapidly. So I look forward to having direct evidence of these genetic changes in human beings, not just in the laboratory. Well, there's lots of possibilities in that. Um, Most definitely. It's an exciting field. I, I you know, can't wait until more research is made public, but at this point it does seem like there's a lid on it. Yeah, because it sounds like what you're talking about is um, ultimate health because, you know, essentially a psychopath is not a healthy individual. You know, and the, the kind exactly. of... 